Emergency alarms and bells will go off. TV and radio stations will cut their programs. The stock exchange will close. Sporting events will be scrapped. Newsreaders will dress in black. RAF will be grounded. Parliament will be hastily reconvened. People will go home. The whole country will come to a halt. It will feel no less than a national emergency. And this all will begin with a single code phrase. London Bridge is down. It's been 66 years since the death of a monarch in Britain and accession of a new one. King George VI died in 1952, making Queen Elizabeth II the new queen, and she has been holding the throne since then. At the age of 92, she is not only the longest reigning monarch in the history of Britain, but also the most loved one as well. Three of the last four prime ministers were born after she came to the throne, and most of the living world's population has only seen one queen on the throne for all of their life, which makes her absence an unimaginable thought. As the law of nature dictates, her reign must end with her unfortunate demise sometime in the future, and when this happens, this will mark as the biggest event of the 21st century. Britain will lose the last living link with its former greatness and the country will use this occasion to revisit its glory once again. The Royal Palace has been preparing for this day since the 1960s under the code name of Operation London Bridge and there have been meetings several times a year behind closed doors to refine the details. The particulars of this grandest plan had remained a closely kept secret until Sam Knight, a journalist for the Guardian newspaper, interviewed dozens of people involved with a promise of confidentiality. Everything down to the last minute is carefully planned to give Queen Elizabeth a farewell the kind of which the world has never seen, and most probably will never see again. So watch till the end of the video and let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. In her final hours, the Queen will be with her family and a team of doctors led by the Queen's senior doctor, Professor Hugh Thomas. He'll constantly monitor her health and also consider what information should be made public. People will be notified about the Queen's health at a regular interval until the last bulletin, which may read something like this. King's life is moving peacefully towards its close. As it happened in the case of George V. George V's doctor then injected him with 750 milligrams of morphine and a gram of cocaine, enough to kill him twice over, primarily to ease the monarch's suffering and give him a peaceful, quick death in time for printing presses of the times, which rolled at midnight. It's expected the Queen's doctor will do the same. The moment the Queen closes her eyes, Charles will be the new king. The first official to get the news of the Queen's demise will be the Queen's private secretary, Edward Young. He will then pass on the information via a secure phone line to the Prime Minister, Theresa May. The demise of George VI was conveyed in a code word, Hyde Park Corner, to prevent switchboard operators from finding out. The civil servants are expected to use the code word, London Bridges Down, to convey the message. The Foreign Office's Global Response Center, based at a secret location in London, will communicate the news to the 15 governments outside the UK where the Queen is also the head of state and the 36 other nations of the Commonwealth for whom she has served as a symbolic figurehead. The Governor's Generals, Ambassadors, Prime Ministers, and other important people in the country, as well as those abroad, will be informed first through secure lines and it may take anywhere from some minutes to a few hours before the news is made public and the rest of the world come to know about the demise of their beloved Queen. The Press Association News Agency and all other global newswire services will be informed simultaneously. As a formal announcement, a footman in morning clothes will emerge and post a black-edged notice to the gates of Buckingham Palace detailing a 10-day mourning period that will commence. At the same time, the palace website will be transformed into a single page showing the same notice on a dark background. At BBC, a Cold War era alert system called RATS, short for Radio Alert Transmission System, will be activated. Reporters and anchors have been rehearsing the death of the Queen for over 30 years, substituting the name Mrs. Robinson. For many years, they have performed mock storylines about the Queen Mother choking on a fishbone. 
These rehearsals will be immediately put into action. BBC 1, 2, and 4 will be interrupted, programs will stop, and after a pause, news will be broadcasted on all of them together. The newsreaders will be wearing black suits and black ties as they inform the world of this unfortunate event in a depressed voice. This news will be repeated several times, with silent breaks in between, after which BBC may go completely silent for a few hours. There is a network of blue lights called Obit Lights installed at Britain's commercial radio stations. They are supposed to be activated in the event of a national catastrophe and are tested once a week. When the news of the Queen's demise breaks, these lights will start flashing to alert the DJs to switch to the news in a few minutes and play inoffensive music in the meantime. There is already a prepared list of music made up of two categories of sad and saddest songs available at every radio station to reach for in times of sudden mourning. Online media outlets and newspapers already have news stories about the Queen's death, lengthy obituaries and articles lined up to publish at a moment's notice. Major news organizations like The Guardian and Times are said to have had as much as 10-12 to 12 days of coverage ready to go. Experts on royal matters have already signed contracts with media houses to speak exclusively on those channels. For those who will be in the air, aircraft pilots will announce the news to them and social media will do the rest of the work. Great Tom at St. Paul's is expected to ring every minute for several hours, while some others will sound for times equal to the Queen's age at her demise. This will be the beginning of 10 days of sorrow and spectacle, which are officially numbered as D-Day, D plus 1, D plus 2, and so on until D plus 9. The 18th Duke of Norfolk will be in charge and Lord Chamberlain's office in the palace will be the center of operations. Both Houses of Parliament will be called within hours of the monarch's death. People will go home early. News crews will assemble on a pre-agreed site outside the palace. They've got a confidential instruction book a couple of inches thick, with every detail of what to do and what not to do. TV schedules for all coming days will be changed. Comedy shows will be restricted on BBC and satire will go completely off air. The National Theatre will close if the news breaks before 4pm. If there's a test match at Lord's, it'll be scrapped. The Marlebin Cricket Club already holds insurance for that matter. Rugby and hockey fixtures will be called off too, while football matches may go ahead. Big screens will be erected in provincial cities so crowds can follow events taking place in London. Mayors across the country will mask their decorations with black flags. Messages will pour in from presidents and parliaments from all over the world. Many nations are expected to announce a several-week mourning period for the Queen. Around 10,000 tickets will be sent for printing for invited guests, the first of which will be required for the proclamation of the new king. Dignitaries coming from European royal families will be put up at the palace. The rest will stay at the Claridge's Hotel. In the days that follow the announcement, the Royal Mint will begin producing new coins with the new monarch's image on them for issue upon accession. Despite the plethora of plannings, everything will have to be signed off by the new king and the Duke of Norfolk. The demise of the Queen will also be the moment of accession for a new monarch. Both of these things will go hand in hand. There will be diplomatic assembling in London, not seen much since the death of Winston Churchill in 1965. Both houses will gather MPs and swear the oath of allegiance to the new sovereign. In the House of the Lords, the two thrones will be replaced by a single chair and in the evening, Charles will make his first address as the head of state. At the same time, the Queen's body will be prepared to be kept in the throne room. The coffin lid must have a false lid to hold the crown jewels, with a rim at least three inches high. Everything will be pre-calculated and perfectly planned. But what if the Queen dies abroad, or when she is in other parts of the country? There's nothing to be foreseen. In case of the Queen dying overseas, a jet aircraft from RAF's number 32 squadron, known as the Royal Flight, will take off from the western ledge of London to bring her back, with a coffin on board. 
A first call coffin is always kept ready by royal undertakers in case of royal emergencies. If she dies at Windsor Castle or Sandringham House, the coffin would be moved by car to Buckingham Palace within a couple of days. The most elaborate plans are for what happens if she passes away in Scotland, where she spends three months of the year. This will initiate a complicated series of Scottish rituals in different cathedrals, at the end of which the coffin would be transported to Waverley Station and then taken by the Royal Train to London. People will line up to meet their queen at railway stations and throw flowers. A second train will run behind the first one to clear flowers and debris off the railway tracks. In every scenario, the queen's body returns to the throne room in Buckingham Palace. On D1, the day after the queen's demise, the flags will go back up and at 11 a.m., Charles will be proclaimed the king of the entree room of St. James Palace. He will carry out the first official duties of his reign by swearing to protect the church in Scotland. The national anthem will be played on drums wrapped in black cloth and trumpeters from the lifeguards will step outside to give three blasts. The proclamations will only just be getting started. Britain will be getting a new king for the first time in 66 years and the world will be watching. This will be the time Britain will show its lost glory one more time. There will be no fleet of bulletproof limousines and fancy cars on the streets. Rather, there will be horses, carriages, and men wearing cocked hats everywhere. A group of men, dressed up as characters of some Shakespeare drama, will go by carriage to the statue of Charles I and read out the news again. A 41-gun salute will be fired from Hyde Park. Heralds with trumpets will then go around spreading the news around the country. High sheriffs will stand on steps of town halls to announce the new sovereign as per local customs. People will be capturing a glimpse of the might of the British Empire in their latest smartphones. Things will be very new to everyone, even for the ones doing it. This will be the time for Charles to go out and meet his people. A four-nation tour by the new king will immediately kick off. He'll stop by places to attend services for remembrance of his mother and meet the leaders of the nation. Lots of it will be done walking around and not by being in a car. On D4, that is, the fifth day of the Queen's demise, her coffin will be taken from the throne room in Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall to lie in state for public viewing for four full days. The procession from Buckingham Palace will be a huge military parade expected to accommodate a million people on the streets of London. It's planned that the parade reaches Westminster Hall just on the hour so that the Big Ben starts to chime as the wheels come to a stop. King Charles will be the first of an expected half a million mourners who will pay homage to their beloved Queen a wondrous queue at least nine kilometers long, equipped with canteens, portable toilets, and police, will stream past the queen for 23 hours a day. Four soldiers will stand vigil for 20 minutes at a time, with two ready in reserve. The most senior of the four will stand at the foot of the coffin, while the most junior at the head. An exact replica of the hall will be set up somewhere nearby, so soldiers can practice their movement before they go on duty. The Queen's children and grandchildren, including women for the first time, will arrive unannounced and stand vigil over their coffin as per tradition. The night before the funeral, there will have been church services in towns across the UK. Football stadiums will be open for memorial services if necessary. Before the dawn on D9, the funeral day, the jewels will be taken off the coffin and cleaned in the silent hall. It'll be the day of great sorrow. People will wake up to a day off. The stock market will not open. Shops will close or go to bank holiday hours, and people will display the picture of the queen in their windows. At 9 a.m., Big Ben will strike. The bell's hammer will then be covered with a leather pad, and it will ring out in muffled tones. Queen Elizabeth II will be the first British monarch to have her funeral in the Westminster Abbey since George II in 1760. At 11 o'clock, the coffin will arrive at the Abbey doors. 
The country will fall silent. The clatter will stop. Train stations will cease announcements. Buses will stop. Drivers will get out at the side of the road. RAF will be grounded. And time will come to a halt. The Archbishop will speak inside the Abbey with 2,000 guests sitting. Broadcasters will refrain from showing royal faces. When the coffin emerges again, it'll be placed on the green gun carrier and hauled by 138 junior sailors of the Royal Navy. From Hyde Park Corner, the hearse will go 23 miles by road to Windsor Castle, where the Queen's body will be buried. The Royal Household will be waiting for their Queen standing on the grass. The coffin will go inside, the cloister gates will close, and cameras will stop broadcasting. This will be the end of an era. This will be the start of a turbulence. The royalty will never be the same again.